I'll now hand over to our MC, Jackie Mumford of the Nature Conservation Council to introduce herself. Good Thank you, Shauna. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm also on Aboriginal land here this evening. I'm on the land of the Awabakal people uh, a bit further north than um, you all there in Lane Cove, but it's a pleasure to be here online this evening um, emceeing this wonderful event. Um, for those of you who don't know the Nature Conservation Council, we're the peak body for grassroots conservation and environment groups around New South Wales. Uh, we represent over 170 grassroots groups, uh, just like the Lane Cove Bushland Society um, and the other wonderful groups who have helped put this event on this evening. So I want to acknowledge the NCC member groups involved um, in, this, uh, in this forum and thank you for putting the time into pulling it together. And obviously, um, thank you so much to all the candidates who've joined us tonight. I know how busy you all are um, in the lead up to March 25 and how precious every minute is. So really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And to be talking about such important issues. Um, we recently conducted some polling at the Nature Conservation Council to uh, test people's views around the state on nature conservation um, and found some really overwhelmingly positive results uh, around concerns about nature um, and we know that um, particularly around areas like the Lane Cove, around Lane Cove, the lower North Shore of Sydney, uh, up into the northern beaches, that climate and environment are huge issues um, that voters really care about. So I'm very excited to be here tonight to be talking about these issues and to be hearing from the Lane Cove candidates on these issues. After two, going on three years now of um, COVID and working remotely and all of those different things, I'm sure we're all very familiar with Zoom and how to use it. Uh, you will have been muted when you came into the meeting tonight. Um, please just know that that is so we can minimise background noise uh, and we can hear from the candidates and, and um, not have too many distractions. Um, please do remain on mute and obviously the candidates um, can control coming on and off mute when you're asked to speak. Um, if you want to keep your camera on so that people can see you, that's, you know, that always creates a nice um, sense of, you know, who's in the Zoom room. If you'd like to do that, uh, we will probably take a photo at some point. So, and and as you know, the, um, the session is being recorded. So if you want to keep your camera off, please do do that. Uh, so what will happen this evening is we will hear from each of the candidates. Um, who have been given three minutes each to present on who they are, what interested in, them run, in what interested them in running this um, state election, uh, and then they've had four pre uh, sorry five pre prepared questions sent to them ahead of time. They'll each be given the opportunity to answer those questions. We will then pull some questions from the chat. So as the uh, presentations go on and as we start hearing from our candidates, I encourage everyone to get involved in the chat. Um, post your questions, comments, reflections in the chat. Um, and we've got some wonderful people behind the scenes who will pull those questions out of the chat. And at the end of this evening, we'll have some time to take some questions from the floor or from the chat box, as it were, to put to our candidates. So please do um, be engaged in there. Um, of course, we want to engage with ideas tonight and not with people. We're not here to treat anyone um, disrespectfully, even if we have differing views to them. Um, always we want to interrogate ideas and, and, um, and not people. So if you're being rude or derogatory or um, intentionally antagonistic in the chat, we won't hesitate to remove you from the meeting um, because that's not the kind of um, culture that we want here this evening. Um, as I said, continue to use the chat. If you're having any problems with technology at all, um, you can flag that in the chat and Christina will help you out. Um, and in the drop down menu, it should be defaulting to everyone in the chat. So just make sure that you send your messages to everyone rather than using the private function so that we can see the questions and we're not doubling up. Um, and Christina will post her uh, number in the chat if um, you're having technical problems so you can give her a call. So that's the plan. Um, and I reckon let's get straight into why we're here to hear from our candidates. So, you know, uh, we'll be hearing from them in alphabetical order. And as we go through the questions, I'll be mixing up the order so that each of our candidates has the opportunity to speak first and last and, and so on. And um, uh, there won't be any bias in the order and the amount of time being given to any candidates. Um, and on that, you know, I just also want to make it clear that the Nature Conservation Council is a registered environmental charity. We're a not-for-profit organisation that is completely apolitical and we are engaged in the state election to raise the profile of environment and nature issues 
uh, and we don't in any way endorse any um, political party. We just try, try to create a race to the top on the issues so that we get the best outcomes possible for nature and the environment. So without um, any further ado, tonight we're going to hear from Heather Armstrong from the Greens, Victoria Davidson, who's running as, as an independent, Penny Pedersen, who's running for the Labor Party, uh, and Anthony Roberts from the Liberal Party uh, could not make it tonight, but has sent Ben Collins to speak on his behalf. So um, he has provided a statement and some responses to the prepared questions to Ben, who will speak on behalf of um, Anthony Roberts. So let's kick it off with three minutes from Heather Armstrong, letting us know a bit about yourself and why you're running. And when you've got 30 seconds left, Heather, I'll let you know. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Christina. This is not my first answer to the question, right? This is just my blurb about myself, correct? This is just an overview about who you are and why you're running. Okay, right. Well, very first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the peoples of the Camaragal and Watermagal lands on whose beautiful Langcode River lands I reside. And reminders of their presence over the last 65,000 years is not very far away because, I'm uh, not very far away because just down the road from me in the Great North Walk are some old Aboriginal middens and evidence of habitation long ago. It would have been a lovely place to live. And um, I very much appreciate the fact that I'm living on their land and I pay my respects to them. <coughs> um, I really decided to join the Greens about six years ago because I did one of those ABC boat check things and I clearly aligned with the Greens most closely. I thought Australians need to step up and join political parties. We can't just stand aside. This is all motivated though by the fact that I was really shocked and grieved by the level of destruction going on on the planet, in the planet and locally in Australia and the very poor quality of governance we have had in Australia, which has alarmed and grieved me for many, many years now. I felt I should do something. I joined the Greens and um, found myself running in elections, um, which was a bit of a shock, but um, here I am again. So um, I really wish to be able to change policies to stop policymakers from ignoring the bleeding obvious, which is that we have to have regard to the science about climate change the denials, the running around, the every attempt to do anything but fix the planet's problems has been alarming, continues to be alarming, even with a Labor government in power. Just today, um, Tanya Plibersek has appointed, um, uh, has extended another 116 gas exploration licenses. It's just not sustainable. Um, we're looking at um, not achieving 1.5 degrees of global warming by 2050, which is the recommended limit for the International Panel on, Panel on Climate Change, we really have to step up. Otherwise, our planet will become uninhabitable, not just for the species who are gonna lose their lives and become extinct, but for us, for people. We're gonna have miserable lives. Many of us already do. The Lismore floods, I've seen it, I've been there. My daughter lives up that way. It is so shocking to drive through Lismore just after those floods and see just how many Meters up the road, they had to park their cars and trucks to get over the 100, the 15 meters. 30 seconds. Thanks. The 15 meters of water that just coursed through their lands, through their houses, ruined their lives. This is, this is just criminal negligence, not to do something seriously about this major problem that we all face, which is continued use of fossil fuels. We simply have to address that problem. And policymakers at all levels have to address that problem. So that's my fundamental motivation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heather. Great modelling on three minutes there. Love to see it. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Victoria Davidson, who is running as an independent for the seat of Lane Cove. Uh, Victoria, please let us know a bit about yourself and why you're running. Oh, you're on mute. You just have to unmute yourself. Sorry. I'm so worried about the dog barking and I do apologise in advance. Um, hi, I'm Victoria Davidson, Community Independent Candidate for Lane Cove. I also acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land where we meet and honour the elders past and present. I am a local businesswoman, lawyer, trained mediator and I'm a mum of three. Um, my career has covered uh, the publishing industry both here and overseas, uh, legal work for a large corporate um, 
law firm, which involved um, working for health organisations in the public and private sector, in-house at Sydney Opera House, as well as pro bono work in the domestic violence sphere and a women's shelter. For the last 12 years, I've been running a podiatry practice or business with my husband. We have two practices, one here in Lane Cove and one in Brookvale. I was very involved in volunteering at my children's primary school, Lane Cove Public, um, where I organised music camps, was a member of the PNC, and I ran the canteen for five years. And our business has been very involved in the local community, sponsoring sporting groups, as well as being a founding sponsor of the Lane Cove Fun Run. We moved here uh, 15 years ago. Uh, we set up a business here uh, 23 years ago. Lane Cove has um, provided us with deep roots and we have um, long lasting friendships here. It's a beautiful place to raise our family. Um, why am I standing? Because I really feel there's a very strong disconnect between what the community wants and what governments make decisions on. And it seems that our political culture has become hardened around conflict rather than on making decisions that are in the best interest of people. It feels like wedge politics takes precedence over, you know, really what we're needing is enduring and thoughtful answers to the big problems that we're facing. And I do feel that the community voice is not treated as a priority. So instead of turn, tuning out, I decided to tune in. And as a community independent candidate, I want to give the community's voice back to parliament. And it's clear from listening to people and being out door knocking and talking that people want fresh ideas and fresh voices at the decision making table. And it's vital to have a diversity of views and life experiences to reflect our community. We don't just have to accept this polarised red and blue of current politics. And I really found that the federal election, the success of the independents was just a revelation that we could um, get our voice back. I think that... 30 seconds, Victoria. Okay. I, I know that independents can raise the quality of debate and they can push for reform in areas that have been gridlocked for a long time by partisan politics. They can help restore integrity and transparency in our government and it can help community take back its voice. I strongly believe we need faster action on climate change and we need to restore integrity in our public and um, political process. Perfect. Thank you, Victoria, for sticking to the time and for introducing yourself. Love it. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Penny Pedersen, who is running with Labor. Thank you so much for being here, Penny. Um, please introduce yourself and let us know a bit about why you're running. Okay, so uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. I'm zooming in from Wallamadi Eagle Land. Um, I've lived in East Ryde uh, for 16 years with my filmmaker husband and our two boys. I studied theatre at UNSW. I became a performer working in film, TV, theatre, radio production and freelance writing. And in addition, I've been a company board director at the Griffin Theatre Company and Northside Radio. Uh, I was a regular guest presenter on ABC Radio uh, um, for a number of years and volunteered at Northside Radio uh, for over a decade, hosting weekly arts programs every Friday and interviewing local artists and environment groups who needed a platform. Um, I became a councillor at the City of Bride in 2017, and since then I've worked really hard for the community and held some great roles. Uh, I chaired the Bushland and Environment and Renewable Energy Advisory Groups uh, at Council. I've represented our region and sector as Vice President of NESROC, Vice Chair of the Parramatta River Catchment Group, uh, Board Director of Local Government New South Wales and the Australian Local Government Women's Association. New South Wales Music Festival Roundtable, and I'm on the Ride Huddersfield Domestic and Family Violence Committee, as well as the Climate Council Cities Power Partnership Local Leader and Spokesperson, which I'm very proud of. Um, I'm passionate about the arts, obviously passionate about climate change and protecting our environment. I'm an activist, and for the last six years, I have worked as the New South Wales organiser for LEAN, the Labor Environment Action Network. Uh, I too, on the vote compass, uh, am identified as a green. So there you go. Just I've, I've chosen to fight in another way. Um, uh, I'm a certified wildlife rescuer, a kayaker who stops to collect litter, and I drive the cheapest fully electric vehicle on the market. I'm certainly not a career politician. Um, I'm uh, not a lawyer. I've never been a political staffer. Um, and I realised a while back how important real life experience is in leadership and in governance. And uh, I think Lane Cove Electorate has some of the most beautiful natural urban bushland, uh, wildlife and waterways in Sydney that must be protected. Uh, I found it very frustrating 
and um, uh, I, I felt powerless as a local government, uh, in local government trying to do that. I want a seat at the table. And I think the more people who are activists like me, uh, who have experienced that um, frustration, uh, who, who move up into state parliament, um, we, we were able to be we able to move things. Uh, there is another, uh, one of the lean executive who is a um, candidate. 30 um, seconds, at, Penny. Uh, at, 30 sorry, seconds. At Heathcote. Um, so there's a few of us running, um, but I have been able to deliver for my community a lot of great things like banning plastic and et cetera in council over the last five to six years in the Western part of the electorate. So my ward takes up a big part of the Lane Clover electorate. Great. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, thanks for thanks for that um, very helpful overview. Uh, now we're going to hear from Ben Collins on behalf of Anthony Roberts, um, who's currently the sitting MP for Lane Cove. And um, Ben, if you could please um, say, uh, yeah, share the prepared statement from Minister Roberts. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I have to apologise that the children are getting out of the bath now, so you might hear some noise, but um, I've told them it's uh, important for them to be quiet. So, um, yes, I've got this, um, I'm representing Anthony Roberts today, he wasn't able to be here. I'd first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, Anthony arrived in the electorate in 1982 and hasn't ever wanted to leave. He loves his community uh, and he gets homesick when he's been away for long periods of time. His wife, Alicia, is a school teacher and they have four boys um, that all go attend local schools in Lane Cove. Uh, he loves his community and his people and service to others has always been drilled into him since he was born. Both of his parents were... Uh, Order of Australia recipients for service to their community. Uh, Anthony serves in the Australian Army in Bougainville uh, and he served eight years on local council at Lane Cove. Uh, this will be his 20th year of service in New South Wales Parliament uh, and he looks forward to 20 more uh, if that's the will of the voters at this next election and the one subsequent. Uh, over the last 20 years he's seen a lot of uh, changes in Lane Cove. The place has grown, shaped, become a better place to live in. And he's proud of his work and seeing the schools being upgraded, securing additional sporting amenities and better playing fields for our children, uh, improving access to the foreshore, upgrading walls, uh, and made the most out of things like Bedlam Bay and created new parks that are accessible for everyone to play. Got new scout halls, boat sheds, upgraded roads. Uh, restoring our heritage buildings has been an important part of bringing life uh, to all parts of our communities. Uh, we've almost completed the remediation of Nelson Parade, uh, which has been a, a very uh, long process and a complex, complex issue. Um, and we're going to see, hopefully, that solved uh, very soon. Um, the, the works have, have begun. Uh, Anthony made a decision a long time ago that he wanted to serve the community so that when he leaves this place, it will be better shape than when he left it for his children and their children to come and everybody's children. Um, so, look, after 20 years, no matter what the issue is, Anthony has always been willing to help, um, loves serving his community uh, and um, uh, would be honoured to be able to represent them for another four years. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ben, and, and thanks for uh, being here. Oh, no. Sorry, I thought I was a mute. Um, thank you for being here over bath time. I know that, that it's a bit of a hard time for um, parents of young kids, so appreciate you um, being here to represent the minister in his absence. Uh, so thank you to all of the candidates for your introduction. We'll now move to um, answering the pre Pre prepared questions. So I will ask the question. Each candidate has a minute and a half to respond to the questions. Um, I know that's not very long to, to, um, 
to grapple with some pretty chunky issues that have been raised in the questions, um, but I will keep an eye on the time and give you a 30 second warning again. Um, for the first question, we'll stick to the same sequence of candidates, which is just alphabetized, and then we'll mix it up for the next question. So the first question is on koalas and habitat protection. The Environmental Defenders Office recently released a report exposing the extent of loopholes in planning and development laws that are pushing koalas toward extinction through the removal of habitat, including our state's sole remaining healthy koala population in southwest Sydney. What do you propose we do to close these loopholes? Um, and obviously a really um, tricky issue in the planning system at the moment is uh, the effectiveness of offsets, which has been criticised by the audit office and is particularly problematic for species like our koalas. Um, do you oppose using offsets in such situations? Heather. Uh, yes, I do in short, in relation to uh, the last question, offsets, but the fundamental problem is the weakness of the Environmental Planning and Biodiversity Conservation Act and the neutering of the protections which were in the, uh, um, uh, the Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, so both those pieces of legislation have been very ineffective to do anything to save our koalas or indeed any species. I mean, you can talk about koalas, but we're talking about every species down to the microbe level to um, which is also suffering. So we really need to um, strengthen legislation to make our laws um, able to measure. We have to have proper measurements of the available habitat we have to have proper accounting for habitat loss. We have to have diagnosis of which particular species are within that, those lost areas. We have to have measures to enforce the reinstatement or the protection of remaining habitat. To increase habitat also is desirable. And this is something which um, our Local Government Act uh, has um, enshrined in its legislation, in its, in its terms, but nothing happens because there's no particular um, driving force behind it. Um, the Samuels report. 30 said, seconds left. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, there's, can I commend to you a wonderful piece of research in the 2019 Conservation Science and Practice Journal, which noted that over 7.7 .7 million hectares of potential habitat and communities were cleared between 2000 and 2017. And of that clearing, 93% was not referred to the federal government. For assessment. In other words, people are doing what they like and there's no enforcement, no follow-up. Nobody goes out and checks. You can just do what you like and there's nobody going to turn up and say, oops, you didn't actually seek an approval for that clearing, did you? It's just open slather. So, um, and if you could make some closing remarks now, Heather, please. Okay, so we really need to reform legislation to strengthen it, to stop it from being the weak, um, the weak, the weak weapon that it is. It's just not able to protect koalas or any habitat. It's just a developer free for all right now. Thank you, Heather. Uh, our next candidate to answer the question is Victoria. Over to you, Victoria. Thanks. Um, well, cumulative effects of planning and development approvals across all of New South Wales um, must consider the impact to koala habitat fragmentation of koala populations, which causes stress and leads to disease, has to be avoided. And we need to ensure the connectivity of koala populations as it's critical to their survival. So I support the recommendations of the Total Environment Centre's Sydney Basin Koala Policy regarding the removal of development loopholes. I'm not gonna go into the details of those because time doesn't permit, but you can find those on the Total Environment Centre's website. Um, in regard to offsets, the use of offsets is problematic for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, how do you offset species that are endemic to a um, specific area? You know, in effect, offsetting is an accounting tool relying on an arbitrary economic valuation of ecosystems, and they're ineffective to protect biodiversity. The current scheme also makes it far too easy for developers to meet their offset obligations through making a cash payment with no guarantee that like-for-like -like offsets will ever be found. The extensive use of off the offset system has created another problem. 30 seconds. That the demand outstrips the supply for available offsets. And it is alarming that the audit office found that 96% of developer demand for species credit is not met by current supply. Um, it's clear from the work of the New South Wales Audit Office and the New South Wales Legislative 
Council's inquiry that urgent reform is required. We need to ensure offsetting is genuinely used as a last resort only for unavoidable impacts of development. So in relation to koala habitat, if we wish to ensure the long-term survivability of the species, um, we cannot allow the use of offsets. Thanks. Thanks so much, Victoria. Uh, I just want to acknowledge now we've got 60 people in the um, Zoom meeting, so it's wonderful to see such a good turnout from Lane Cove. Uh, well done. Um, the next candidate we're going to hear from on koalas and habitat is Penny. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 60. Woo! <laughs> That's great. Um, last year, uh, I joined the Warrenora Heights community and uh, to gather signatures for a petition to stop Sydney Waters DA to rezone uh, koala habitat. Um, it was really important, I felt, and I took the time to do it. Fortunately, uh, they, um, they withdrew uh, their DA, but a Labor government will transfer that land that I'm talking about at Warrenora Heights uh, to the National Parks and Wildlife Service for permanent protection. Uh, Labor will create, of course, a great uh, koala national park on the mid-north coast of New South Wales and protect those wildlife corridors in South Sy southwest Sydney. As I said, I'm an activist and I know a lot more than needs to be done. Uh, Labor will um, uh, complete a national parks establishment plan as part of the commitment to Australia providing 30% of land protection by 2030. Labor will also have more to say on protecting koala habitat in the lead up to the election, uh, including uh, koala friendly infrastructure being built as part of development. Uh, the koala strategy is spending money but not saving koalas at the moment. Labor will refocus that, the, the strategy, and uh, turn 30 it seconds. Comprehensive species recovery plan uh, through the statu statutory uh, review of the Biodiversity Conservation Act. Labor will strengthen environmental protections to stop runaway land clearing and fix the biodiversity offset scheme. I have got more, but I'll wait if you want me to do it later. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Penny. Appreciate that. Um, uh, so, lastly, we're going to hear from Ben representing um, Anthony Roberts again. Thank you, Ben. You just pull yourself off mute there. Unmute myself. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Look, first of all, um, I want to I want to stress that um, yeah, the, the koala is facing a lot of a lot of threats, including not just habitat loss, but fragmentation, degradation, climate change, disease. Um, declining genetic diversity, vehicle strike, bushfire, dog attack. There are a lot of things um, that that are uh, harming our koala population. Um, that's why the New South Wales government has developed a koala strategy, um, which aims to double the number of um, the koala populations uh, by 2050. Um, so the New South Wales koala strategy uh, is, in, is in response to the findings of the inquiry into um, koala populations and habitats in New South Wales, um, which con concluded that without government intervention, koalas could be extinct by 2050. So it is obviously a very serious problem. Uh, the strategy that the New South Wales government is, um, is implementing is backed by $190 million in funding, which is the biggest commitment by any government uh, to a single species in Australia. New South Wales strategy, koala strategy delivers a range of targeted conservation actions to secure 30 seconds. Uh, support community conservation, address key threats to koala safety, health, and utilize science to research to build knowledge. Uh, on top of that, New South Wales government has commenced a five year stat statutory reviews um, of the Biodiversity Conservation Act of 2016 and the native vegetation provisions of the Local Land Services Act. So the New South Wales government's koala state environmental planning policy of 2021 applies to all non-rural land in council areas with known koala populations, including all of Sydney, um, the Sydney Basin local government areas, and accounts for 95% uh, where development occurs in those areas. And the policy imposes requirements. For and if I could just get you to wrap up. Oh, Thanks, um, yeah, look, it's a... Uh, I've got I've got lots more on this, but it's a, I might have to save it for later because there is there's obviously a, a very big plan, a complex problem that we're all trying to solve. So, um, yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. I know. Sorry, I know that it's a short amount of time. And and half I did actually, if anybody else has got the timer going, I let it <laughs> go over by about 20 seconds there. But um, 
yeah, I know there's a, there's a lot, lot of big chunky issues to get through. No um, so the next question uh, for our candidates this evening is on plastics. Plastic is an ever-growing problem, and in response, governments are banning single-use items. Um, New South Wales is at the back of the pack with uh, WA, South Australia, and Queensland moving ahead and banning heavyweight plastic bags, takeaway containers, and disposable coffee cups. What will you do in the next term of government to reduce plastic pollution? Um, and then we've just got a follow-up question there about um, uh, alternatives to re reusables in Australia. Um, for example, um, carry bags, would you support New South Wales imposing a reusable standard like the one proposed by the Boomerang Alliance? Um, and, you know, how would you make that um, recycle economy a reality? So this time we'll hear from Victoria Davidson first. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks. Um, I'm very concerned that Australians generate more single-use plastic waste per capita than any other country in the world, about 60 kilograms a year. That's four times the global average. So it is clear we need mandated targets in New South Wales if we want to ensure real progress towards a circular economy. I would support an acceleration of a time, the time frame for reviewing products slated for potential bans and extend this to a wider range of items to ensure New South Wales is aligned um, with jurisdictions like WA and um, South Australia. Um, this incorporates, you know, heavyweight plastic bags, fruit and veggie produce bags, um, you know, um, I won't go into those. Sorry, I'm so worried about the time. Um, I would also support a ban on the release of all balloons, which recognise that balloons, the release of balloons is littering. New South Wales has been a laggard in single-use plastic and we really need to get to the top quickly. We need to phase out problemat problematic plastics and increase funding to create a viable market for recycling soft plastics. Um, in regard to uh, reusables, we need stronger incentives to reduce plastic in manufacturing and design. We need standards and legislation which work towards minimising the use of plastic where possible and ensuring old plastic can be turned into new products rather than turning it into waste. Uh, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting is done seconds. at the consumer level. Um, and whilst consumers have a role to play in the adoption of re uh, reusable plastic alternatives, we really need to enforce change at the industry level. I support the development of a reusable standard for shopping bags, like the one proposed by the Broomerang Alliance. Standards in the plastics industry could help us reduce waste at all stages of the product's life life cycle um, from design to manufacture to recycling. And, and if you could start wrapping up, Victoria. Wrapped up. <laughs> You're done. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we're next going to hear from Penny. Thank you, Penny, on plastics. Okay, thank you. So first, let me say I have rallied hard in my role as a counsellor uh, against plastic, and I initiated an organisation-wide ban on single-use plastic, which includes all the festivals and everything that we have. And it was the first council in New South Wales to officially resolve to have a ban. Uh, Labor would like to see a nationally consistent approach to plastic pollution and supports the federal government's recent move to join the High Ambition Coalition to end plastic pollution. Uh, when we are elected in New South Wales, we will work to restrain the consumption and production of plastic to sustainable levels. We'll enable a, a kind of circular economy for plastics in which plastic products are either reused, recycled or remanufactured uh, when no longer useful or required for their initial purposes and achieve environmentally sound management and recycling of uh, plastic waste. A Labor government will look for opportunities to accelerate the reduction of plastics through the New South Wales Plastic Plan. I personally feel nobody's listening at the moment. Uh, small business where I live still gives out plastic. Um, Labor will examine the evidence base and best practice recommendations to find ways to reduce plastic products and develop new best practice standards, including regarding reusable plastic products like heavyweight plastic bags. 30 seconds. Okay. Stewardship is incredibly vital and it needs to be addressed at a federal level through strategies like the Minister's uh, Product Stewardship List, uh, which this year grew to include tyres, mattresses and plastics in healthcare products. Um, and the makers and importers of uh, those products on the, on the list must take responsibility for the impacts of their products on the environment across their entire life cycle. Uh, and and um, it goes above and beyond recycling. So I think that's important. And if you want to hear more about that from me, I gave an impassioned speech at the Labor uh, conference. Um, so if you want to see it, it's on, my, it's on my Facebook page. And I talk a lot about circular economy. Thanks, Penny. 
Uh, next, we'll go uh, to Ben um, on plastics. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the New South Wales the New South Wales government has a comprehensive and funded New South Wales Plastics Act Action Plan to reduce the impacts of plastics on the environment. As part of that plan, uh, we banned lightweight plastic bags, plastic cutlery, personal care items, bowls and plates, and other unnecessary. Uh, single-use plastics and they're committed to delivering the remaining measure in the plan in the next term of government, including reviewing for phase-out heavyweight plastic bags, produce bags, fruit stickers and a range of other items. Our approach to this transition, transition has always been to incentivise people uh, to join us along this journey, which is why we've announced that we intend to expand the successful return and earn uh, container deposit scheme to include wine and spirit bottles as well as other large containers. Um, now, uh, the New South Wales has um, committed to working with other jurisdictions and the private uh, sector to design out waste and pollution, uh, keep materials in use and foster markets to achieve circular economy by 2023. That will include efforts to develop nationally harmonised definitions to support the phase out of problematic single use plastics and reform the thirty seconds of packaging by twenty twenty five. The New South Wales government has also promoted the circular economy through the Circular Materials Fund to address plastic up the supply chain and provide additional funding for recycling uh, facilities. Great, thank you. And lastly, Heather. What's your response on plastics? Um, yes, well, the fundamental problem is that there's no market for any products that are remade from plastic. It's all very well and good to talk about a circular economy, but a circular economy involves people having buying those products that are remade from, from plastic. Single-use plastic, obviously, is the biggest problem, although I note that there are there's probably more environmental harm from one use of a paper bag than there is from one use of a plastic bag because of the environmental inputs into those two products. So reuse of any um, carrying or container item is, is desirable. But the circular economy is very problematic because we don't have markets. We haven't got support. Look at the collapse of the red cycle, um, uh, plastic bag collections at Woolworths and sorry, Coles. It's not able to be sustained unless somebody's going to buy the end product. So there needs to be government intervention and support for the development of industries that can not only recycle and reuse these products, but also try to create markets for them and uh, therefore ensure the ongoing circularity of that of those uh, substances. Because there's no doubt that it's a massive problem. The amount of pollution in the oceans is, is just revolting. Kate Fairman introduced a bill on the 8th, on 5th, 18th of February 2021 called the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Amendment Plastics Reduction Bill 2021. It's 30 still, seconds, Heather. It's still sitting there. Nobody has allowed that bill to go up for a debate. It hasn't been dealt with. The overview requires for the phasing out of single-use plastics, uh, plastic microbees and other products, establish a plastics reduction commission and require the commission to develop reports and liaise with industry and government to plan for measures to meet specified plastics elimination targets, but nothing's happened with that bill. There is legislative support there for getting on with this, but nobody's taking any notice of it. Great, thank you. And thanks again to all of our candidates for answering those questions um, and encouraging everyone to use the chat. If you've got other questions that haven't been covered yet this evening, please pop them in the chat. And if we've got time for those questions, we'll get to them. Uh, but uh, now we have another one of our pre-prepared questions for the candidates, this time on coal-fired power stations and renewable energy. Worldwide fossil fuel air pollution is known to cause over 9 million premature deaths each year on par with cigarettes. A significant percentage of pollution in northern Sydney comes from coal-fired power stations in the Hunter Valley and Lake Macquarie regions. How do you propose for New South Wales to transition towards cheaper and cleaner renewable energy, eventually getting to 100%? Um, as has already been achieved in the ACT and Tasmania. Uh, and we'll pop that question in the chat. Uh, and for this one, if we could hear from you first, Penny. Thanks. 
Uh, New South Wales Labor will take an active role in transitioning New South Wales to a renewable powered state. Uh, Lean were very excited after, you know, we've been in their ear for a long time to hear the, the Labor, that Labor government will create the New South Wales Energy Security Corporation, the ES, ESC, uh, seeded with $1 billion to accelerate investment in renewable projects. Uh, its role will be to partner with industry on projects that provide affordable, accessible and reliable renewable energy to New South, to New South Wales. Sorry, um, Its role will be to partner with industry, the New South Wales ESC uh, will deliver cleaner energy, lower New South Wales emissions and help us do our part to tackle climate change. Labor will also guarantee the state's commitment to reaching net zero by actually legislating targets and establishing the commission. The net zero commission uh, will develop a plan uh, to reach net zero by 2050 as well as the interim projection targets and monitor and review the plan uh, and the trajectory. Uh, the Premier has a, a questionable track record on climate change uh, and the Liberals had a chance to demonstrate their commitment to net 30 zero seconds. and positioning to a cleaner New South Wales last year, but they chose to vote against Labor's bill uh, to legislate the emission reduction targets. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Penny. Uh, next up, Ben. Thank you. Um, so taking action on climate change is uh, not only a challenge New South Wales government is up to, but a challenge that uh, we can lead on. In 2020, the government launched the first stage of its net zero plan. Since the launch of the plan, New South Wales government has made significant progress, including the launch of the most ambitious renewable energy uh, electric vehicle hydrogen industry decarbonisation policies in Australia. The plan sets out a target for achieving net zero emissions by 2050. In its uh, 2021 and 2022 net zero plan implementation updates, the New South Wales government also set interim re emissions reduction targets of 50% by 2030, 70% by 2035. The plan outlines uh, the New South Wales government's plans to grow the economy, uh, create jobs and to reduce the cost of living through strategic emissions reduction initiatives across the economy. Major emissions reductions initiatives under the plan include the New South Wales Electric Electricity Infrastructure Roadmap, which will deliver a modern energy system for the state and unlock investment in seconds. renewable energy. Net Zero uh, Industry and Innovation Program, which will help reduce emissions from New South Wales industrial sector and invest in new clean technologies for the future. New, the New South Wales Electric Vehicle Strategy, which will accelerate the uptake of electric vehicles. New South Wales Hydrogen Strategy, which will support the growth of a hydrogen industry. The New South Wales Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy, which will reduce emissions through better waste and materials management. The New South Wales Primary Industries Productivity and Abatement Program, which will support farmers and land managers across the state to access environmental markets, reduce their emissions and enhance biodiversity on their land alongside production. Uh, renewable energy backed up by... If you can yeah, wrap up that bit. Um, we're just doing so much. I don't think we have enough time to get through it all, but um, uh, I, I suppose I'll, I'll leave it there because I've got, I've got too much more that... Um, uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Yeah. And I noticed the strategy there of just speaking a little bit more quickly to try and get it in the, in the time frame. Uh, it's Couldn't a, get it's it quick a, enough. Yeah. Uh, and next we're going to go to Heather on um, climate and energy. Thank you, Heather. Yes, thanks, Katina. Um, the Greens want to phase out burning and exporting thermal coal by 2030, and that really rests upon no new coal mines, no, no more gas power stations, no gas exploration, no fracking. We cannot keep on, as Adam Bant would say, for petrol on the fire, pouring petrol on the fire. We want to stop global warming and we have to transition away from it by stopping uh, the creation of those fuels. So we need to switch to 100% renewable energy as soon as possible, develop more batteries, upgrade the electricity grid, reduce the cost of electric cars, and fund climate change by taxing big corporations and stopping massive government support for fossil fuel industries. Um, the I think it's about $11.6 billion worth of um, support over the last year for fossil fuel industries. Um, the fuel tax uh, uh, is one of them. So um, we need to support regional economies and support the workers during their transition into clean energy. And there's plenty of ways to do it. I mean, Germany's done this. This is not new stuff. You need to create new green industries. You need to actually re-educate, provide money, it costs money. 
um, to re-educate and support these workers into new, in new industries. The Mount Arthur coal mine, which is closing in 2030, has 2,000 workers. They can't just be abandoned. We have to look after these workers. 30 seconds. Move them into industries that are supportive of a green economy rather than continuing to do the same old thing decade in, century out. So this, the important thing is to be imaginative and work with unions and bosses must work together to try to create the transition process for these workers into, into other industries because we need to develop more green industry in Australia, not just the same old ship it overseas and let them do it. We need to build stuff here. And Mr. Albanese agrees with me on that point. So I think that's an important aspect of- Thanks. Transition. Great, thank you, Heather. Uh, and lastly, on climate and energy, Victoria. Thanks. Um, it's really surprising that more attention is not given to the impacts of fossil fuel on our air quality and human health. Um, in Australia, air, air pollution, primarily from burning fossil fuels, already causes about 3,000 premature deaths per year. So urgent work is needed to transition New South Wales to a green economy. We need to employ all available resources as it requires a fundamental shift in our energy capacity and transmission. So I propose the following actions that are critical to us achieving 100% renewable energy, that we must legislate faster emissions reductions targets. I support 60% by 2030, 80% by 2035 and net zero by 2040. We need clear emissions reductions planning for all sectors, including hard to abate sectors. Uh, legislation must ensure built-in monitoring and accountability and regular reporting to Parliament and a Climate Change Joint Parliamentary Committee would strengthen monitoring, reporting and public confidence. A whole of government approach is required for climate change solutions. We need a climate change lens applied to all government projects and decisions to ensure they're not incompatible with achieving these emissions reductions targets. Seconds. Um, we need to stop coal and gas, new coal and gas projects. We need to acknowledge that Australia is one of the highest per capita CO2 emitters, and we need an acceler accelerated transition away from fossil fuel exports to green industries, including critical minerals and rare earth mining and value added manufacturing. We need to introduce a progressive coal royalty um, similar to Queensland, with these additional funds being specifically designed to support regional communities tran to transition. Acceleration and prioritisation of investment in renewable energy products and, and transmission you could infrastructure. Start to wrap up, Victoria. Yep, and we need recognition that we need active leadership and vision for the transition to a zero carbon economy, including significant investment in building the highly skilled workforce needed to decarbonise our future. Thanks. Thanks, Victoria. Lovely, thank you. Uh, the next <laughs> question is on heat stress. Um, as we know, heat stress causes more premature deaths than um, all other causes of mortality from extreme weather events. Uh, with this in mind, how would you balance the demand for affordable new housing with the need to ensure that suburbs will be livable during extreme temperatures? Um, and if we can go to you first, Ben, um, and again, I'll do the, the timer. Uh, okay, so um, New South Wales government has a number of programs aimed at addressing urban heat stress, particularly in Western Sydney, including the installation of solar panels uh, on social housing, establishing new parks and green spaces and include increasing tree planting efforts. Um, these include installing more than 5,500 solar panels, uh, retrofitting 2,000 reverse cycle air conditioners and installing ceiling insulation in more than 20,000 social housing homes. Uh, investing more than $400 million in statewide public spaces programs, creating parks and nature-based recreation to increase shade and cool down suburbs, awarding $35 million to 32 Greater Sydney Councils for 131 tree planting and innovation projects, supporting local government to take a strategic approach to canopy management by providing $1.37 million to 28 councils to prepare and update the local urban forest strategies, develop tree inventories, and develop community engagement projects. These tree planting initiatives help to us achieve two New South Wales uh, Government Premier's priorities, reaching our ambitious goal of planting 1 million trees by the end of 2022, and the successful increase of the proportion of homes in urban areas with 10 minutes within 10 minutes walk of quality open and public space by 10%. We're also on track to achieve our target of increasing tree canopy cover to 40% uh, by 2036. 
The new sustainable buildings policy released in August last year also sets new standards around energy efficiency and ensures homes are naturally cooler in summer and warmer in winter. Thanks, Ben. Uh, next, we're going to go to Heather Armstrong on heat stress. Thanks, Heather. I recall going to a Total Environment Centre forum a few years ago when a doctor from the Western suburbs was just ropeable about the, the harm being done to her patients, people dying, people suffering cardiac arrest, people having all kinds of health problems because it's just unlivable out there. Now, former Minister, Plant Planning Minister Rob Stokes worked for two years with the Institute of Architects and Landscape Architects to develop the design and place state environmental planning policy. As soon as Minister Roberts took over that portfolio, he had a private meeting with the Urban Task Force and a bunch of other developers and immediately announced that it was not going to be created as law. That was a disgrace. That design and place SEP would have increased the livability and the affordability of those houses and units to a level that would have been a benchmark for building construction in New South Wales. It is a tragedy that, that hasn't happened. The need to move on building standards is, is paramount. Open spaces and, and, and the design of place set dealt with open spaces, it set the benchmark for how we can reorder our urban planning and our um, environments to enable people not to be suffering these terrible outcomes. Don't forget that Penrith was the hottest place on earth with 49 degrees um, back in uh, 2019. So this is not a joke. People are dying because of this. And if you could start to wrap up, Heather. It's highly necessary that we address this problem by reforming building codes. The, don't forget that Mr Roberts turned up in Parliament in 2017 with a lump of black coal and said, this is great. This is your friend. Well, coal is not our friend, never has been. Nothing good will ever come from this government with regard to improving building standards while this sort of attitude continues. We need to move on and recognise there's a real problem with climate change and implement the design and place SEP, regardless, of, regardless of what Harry Triggerboff might want. Thanks, Heather. Thanks for that. Uh, next on heat stress, on the heat stress issue, uh, Victoria Davidson. Thanks, Victoria. Yeah, I was very disappointed to see the action taken by Anthony Roberts to abandon those essential planning rules for a greener and more sustainable housing developments. Climate resilience initiatives are essential to ensure our cities and towns are prepared for the risks associated with global warming, and they're happening now. Urban planning plays a critical role in climate policy and sustainable initiatives for new buildings and retrofitting existing buildings are critical if we are to achieve emissions reductions targets. The intensification of our urban environment will continue. So it's critical that we must ensure we are building a healthy city with community wellbeing at the centre. We cannot leave strategic planning to the developer. It will never be in the interests of, the, of a developer to maximise green space and mature tree canopy or to provide a diversity of housing types. And yet this is what our community wants, health and wellbeing. So I will support reforms that will deliver climate resilient and climate protective housing, introducing sustainability planning principles to tackle the problems of urban heat, the need to increase the amount of tree canopy and local green spaces, improve walkability to services and retrofit existing homes for higher energy efficiency standards. 30 seconds. Hold the government to account to implement, regularly review and publicly release the flood and bushfire inquiry planning reforms prioritise public transport networks and active transport in the planning process, call on the government to prepare a roadmap and timetable for operational and embodied carbon reduction in the built environment and require government entities and departments to comply. We also need to adopt water sensitive cities approach, including development of wetland landscapes to capture and treat stormwater, increase carbon sequestration and cool environments. And we need to ensure that land use developments uh, we need to ensure land use development decisions take into account greenhouse gas emissions, including scope three emissions on fossil fuel projects. Thanks, Victoria. Um, and Penny, over to you for the last of our candidates on heat stress. Great, thank you. Thank you for going there, Heather, on the design and place step. It saves me some time. Um, another thing too, Labor has repeatedly asked the government how many of the million trees planted so far have actually survived. 
and, uh, and we've never been given an answer. Uh, we will take stock and we will revisit uh, if we win government. As part of our commitment to net zero, Labor will establish a net zero commission to plan, monitor and review our trajectory to net zero by 2050. New South Wales needs a climate adaptation action plan for the built environment in New South Wales that will actually work and to help communities be climate ready and Labor will deliver it. The Liberals and Nationals committed to a climate adaptation plan in 2016 and then in 2021, they were slammed by the Auditor General for non-delivery. Uh, last year, after six year wait, the government produced a plan that didn't deliver a cent to adaptation and gave no clear overall of where dollars needed to be spent. It was a plan for more plans. Uh, communities are feeling the effects of climate change right now. Temperatures 30 are 30 seconds. And a, and a tree canopy is disappearing across urban areas. We need to mitigate the effects of climate change while adapting to the situation that we're facing right now. Labor will work with local councils and communities right across government to protect populations from heat stress, stress including valuing and protecting our trees that provide essential cooling effects where possible. And as a councillor, I have worked hard uh, to keep mature canopy trees and plant new street trees. But the elephant in the room is, is development. And of course, we're going to have to address that. Great, thank you. Thanks to all of our candidates for your uh, responses to that question on heat stress. Uh, we've got our final prepared question, our pre-prepared question for the candidates before we move to a Q&A from the audience. So please uh, keep chatting away, keep using the chat if you've got questions um, or anything that you're concerned about in terms of New South Wales environment or the local environment in Lane Cove that hasn't been covered yet this evening, please pop it in the chat and a reminder to try and frame your question in a way that it can be posed to all of the candidates. So our final question uh, this evening is, what do you think are the most pressing environmental issues in the Lane Cove electorate? And what would you ask Parliament to do about those issues if elected? Uh, and we'll start with Heather on the last question. You'll just have to come off mute, Heather. Sorry. Uh, so the South, St Leonard's South, precinct high density development has caused great grief and angst amongst local people. There's all kinds of problems with it, but the main problem is that there's no community input, that it's called state significant development. And the Liberal government has made sure that when developments are of a certain size, nobody can have any say in them. So the lack of ability to have, a, have any kind of say in that development has been causing real problems. So the Environmental Planning and uh, Assessment Act, when it was introduced by the Labor government, gave third party rights to anybody to sue about um, development applications. It's just been destroyed. There's no ability for anybody to have any impact, let alone not even be consulted, let alone sue. So those legislative changes have deliberately caused massive disenfranchisement of the community who, ha who now, have no, now have no say. The Lane Cove uh, Golf Club Sport and Recreation Centre, I think it's coming back to council in March. Um, it was a draft DA. It's uh, apparently a design... 30 seconds. The sport and not community groups. The Lane Cove site is not appropriate and it would impact Gore Creek and Tree Canopy. So council should work with other councils to maximise the efficient use of green space across the lower North Shore. Privatisation of buses is another big problem. I know the 272 ran a private pirate bus route. I think a few people hopped on that to create some publicity. Um, and uh, that's probably one of the major ones. All of Region 7 buses um, are now privatised and people are screaming because there's cancellations and they can't get their kids to school. That's a Thanks. real problem. Thanks, Heather. Um, next candidate, Victoria, on what you think the most pressing local issues are in Lane Cove. Um, thanks, Heather, for addressing um, lack of community consultation in development. I'm going to raise um, climate okay. change being being the most pressing environmental issue which is facing Australia and specifically Lane Cove. The preservation and maintenance of our natural environment is paramount, including resisting adoption of synthetic grass sport fields and ensuring development and planning is in line with community needs and expectations. Increased development with accompanying increase of hard surfaces has resulted in significant increase in stormwater moving through catchment areas into Lane Cove River and Harbour. And the impact to our waterways and natural environment are critical. 
the increased erosion of creek beds due to water excessive water moving rapidly through catchment areas resulting in tree loss and species decline in bushland park um, creek bed erosion is negatively impacting on the survival of species and i would support an evidence-based program aimed to assist with stormwater management in particular exploring the possibility of a trial of creek flow regime to protect creek health and viability extending 30 seconds extending to a creation of water sensitive catchment of Bob Campbell Oval. Um, sediment buildup from site erosion in rainfall impact, impacts our waterways and creates future environmental issues. So the adoption of Get the Site Right program by Lane Cove Council in line with Hunters Hill and City of Ride Councils would, is imperative. Um, and the funding of national parks has been inadequate as well as our need to ensure and preserve our open space and protecting a mature tree canopy in Lane Cove. The erosion Thanks. of Lane Cove, Ooh. sorry, just one quick thing. Yeah. The erosion of Lane Cove in the planning process means that there's less ability to protect the local environment and the planning system needs reform in order to put communities back at the centre of the system. Thanks, Victoria. Um, next, we're going to hear from Penny on uh, the most pressing local environmental issues. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning Get the Site Right. That was something that we formulated through the Parramatta River Catchment Group with councils. And um, I gave an interview last year at the Fifth Estate about that. It's really important stuff. Uh, but very quickly, this is about sediment control as well. And this is a very important issue. Um, many of you may not know this. Um, the Western Sydney Harbour Tunnel, which we all know is a giant tree massacre, uh, has dealt another environmental blow, um, this time on Lane Cove National Park. Uh, the modification that been, that's gone in uh, the DA for modification to the Western Sydney Harbour Tunnel development includes a spoil dump site at Porters Creek, and it could have a significant impact on the environment, including damage to local wildlife, uh, potentially harmful changes to Porters Creek, Lane Cove River water quality. Uh, the area is home to very important species like powerful owl. Now, this is going to be a 24... They, they are saying themselves, Transport for New South Wales, have distributed flyers... Uh, in certain parts, it's not at, at all a widespread consultation, um, about 24-7 operation and construction of this dump site. Uh, it will have up to... 30 seconds. It's such a long thing. I really need to sort of just get it out there. Please have a read uh, of my media release on my, my website and on my Facebook page because this is a big issue and this it's up at the moment. Consultation has closed. The, the EPA have flagged it as a major issue for methane. Uh, there's, there's, there's a threat for, for methane from the fill site where they're going to put this spoil uh, dump site. And there's also um, uh, the sediment control uh, is not in place to, for, for, a, for a, an operation of this size. So they're saying it's the same as what is going on on that site at the moment, but what they're proposing is enormous. And... Uh, yeah it does threaten the park and the waterways. Thanks, Penny. Thanks for that. Um, and lastly, on most pressing local environmental issues, uh, back to you, Ben. Thank you. Um, look, the natural environment of Lane Cove is one of the things that makes this area so special and Anthony's fought hard to enhance and protect the local uh, natural environment. We are blessed. We are truly are blessed to live here. So it's uh, so close to such an incredible natural environment. Things place such a brilliant park, field of Mars, and and so many natural treasures on our on our foreshores. Um, we need to continue to protect and enhance that as a, as an ongoing practice. Um, we get a lot of support, obviously, from uh, groups like the Lane Cove uh, Bushland Conservation Society, the Right Home Hill Flora and Fauna Preservation Society. Um, and we need to, uh, as, a, as a government, which we continue to do, work with these groups to, to find out how we can continue to look after and preserve these, um, uh, these, these natural treasures. Uh, we have, uh, as, as a government, um, New South Wales government has um, worked to remediate the um, Nelson Parade, which I, I would say the last election would have been the biggest um, uh, environmental seconds. issue brought up. Um, we were, we've been working to clean up the Lane Cove River so we can make that swimmable again. And we've, um, as part of the Parramatta River catchment organisation with um, Penny Peterson, as mentioned before, we've got uh, new sites opening up, uh, Bed uh, Bedlam Bay um, and 
And um, I, if I could just wrap up, I think last of all, we need to uh, work with all levels of government, both federal and locally. Uh, as a state government, we can provide a lot of funding, but a lot of the time it's local councils who are custodians of these, of these spaces and their local environment. So we'll continue to work with local councils to improve our, um, our natural environment. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for that. And thank you to all of the candidates for preparing such thoughtful um, and well-considered responses to the pre-prepared questions. I appreciate that you tried to get a lot through in a small amount of time there. So thank you very much for doing that and for all of your work that's um, gone into those responses, but more broadly gone into campaigning for your local area. Uh, we're now going to take some questions from the audience. So thank you to everyone who has taken the time to put a question in the chat. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to elicit a bit more from our candidates uh, in terms of what they're going to be doing um, if elected to advocate for, um, for nature and the environment and, and for climate. Um, so I believe, um, Corinne, you're going to help me out with um, collating some of the questions and pulling out some of the uh, major themes. Um, I'll pass it to you for the first question from the chat, Corinne. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the candidates and to Ben as well. Um, we had quite a few uh, important questions and Jade and Justin have helped to sort through those. Um, Jackie, could you just clarify how long each candidate has to answer the question? We'll stick with a minute and a half, just um, looking at the time now. I think that'll give us um, enough time to get through probably two or three questions from the audience. Okay, so so hopefully the first one will be fairly straightforward and short because it requires a yes or a no. Will each candidate support an end to native forest logging within the next two years? Uh, and let's go Victoria, Penny, Ben, and then Heather. Uh, yes, and by 2024. Thank you. Penny? Did you hear the question, Penny? Are you there? Cutting out. Uh, the question oh, sorry, your internet. Yeah. The question was, will, will each candidate support an end to native forest logging within the next two years? Well, I can tell you, um, if you have a look at um, my socials, you'll understand exactly what I think. Um, I would have to take that on notice as for uh, Labor policy, but um, as I say, I direct everybody to my social media um, and to Lean's website to know exactly where I said. Okay. Thanks, Penny. And Ben? Oh, if you can answer on behalf yeah, of the I'm, minister. I'm, I'm, I'm going to yeah, be yeah. able to answer that. I'm, I'm not yeah. a candidate, so... Sorry. Yeah, sure. And Heather. Yes, absolutely. And um, the Greens will strongly resist any attempts by the Liberals to water down the protections of native forests, which they have attempted to do uh, by allowing the uh, felling of burnt trees. That should never happen. It's a key threatening process. And there must be greater protections for native forests from go to woe, in particular habitat protections for hollow tree hollows. Yep, the answer is yes. Thank you very much. Next question. To all candidates, what do you think you can achieve in your first two years as a local member? So I'll say, and, yeah. What do you think you can achieve in your first two years as a local member? And this time, let's go Penny, Victoria, and then Heather, and I'll keep an eye on the time. Thanks, Penny. Oh, okay. Um, so did I mention that I'm the other thing that's really threatening um, our, our area and all areas across Sydney, but particularly the work that we've been doing on the Parramatta River catchment group and on other waterways is the sale, the privatisation of Sydney water. It's incredibly important um, that we keep that in public hands. Uh, I, I know from the modelling that we've done on the Parramatta River um, and looked at all the technical reports that the one of the, the most important thing, that's why they're our lead agency, uh, the most important thing is to make sure that all of those um, overflow, all that overflow infrastructure is maintained and um, that any uh, failures are mitigated quickly. Um, and I would not like to see that in the hands of a private company. <laughs> It's incredibly important, and we'd also probably lose them as um, as a collaborator on the on the um, our living river master plan, which took many many years to formulate, and 
we've got everybody on board. It's such a great collaborative thing. Um, but it would be a, it would be detrimental to our waterways if we were to if Sydney water to were to be sold and privatised. Thanks, Penny. Over to you, Victoria. I would hope in the first two years of the next term of government we would have legislated emissions reductions targets. I think that is absolutely imperative, and we can't move forward without it. Um, I would also um, support the non privatisation of Sydney water. Um, the fact that our catchment area is over a large amount of koala habitat, um, that is incredibly important land that has to be maintained. Um, and as I said, stopping of native forests, the logging of native forests needs to occur by 2024. Um, and I would also like to see um, a, an end to not um, coal and gas projects within the first two years. Thanks, Victoria. Um, and Heather, what would you like to achieve in your first two years if elected? There's so much to do, in particular with regard to those at risk of the climate change disaster we're experiencing, floodplains. We need to deal with the fact that people are living on floodplains, which has been improperly zoned as uh, residential areas, re relocate those people and rezone that land. We need to assess the whole Sydney Basin with regard to the climate change risks posed by Posed by the dwellings and their location and rezone where, where necessary so that people don't experience this um, destruction of their life, their lives. Oregamba Dam must never be raised. It's going to ruin a World Heritage Area and there are many other ways to deal with that problem which are far more sustainable. The, the short-term solution is no solution because it just means it takes it a little bit longer before it starts flooding the floodplain below. Um, emissions controls are incredibly important. We need to stop stop this uh, constant emphasis on tunnels and roads and move towards public transport. We need to increase bikes, bicycle ways, move people into local communities where infrastructure is available within a short period of time, like a walk say 15, 20 minutes so they can access it by foot or on cycles. We need to change the whole focus of our urban design so that it's not just about cars driving long distances. The whole concept of having these long tunnels is absolutely wrong, they're dinosaurs. The whole work structure has changed since COVID. People are working from home. We don't need that sort of infrastructure anymore. We need to move towards local infrastructure. And of course, Thanks. biodiversity. We need to fix those two pieces of legislation that I was mentioning earlier. Thanks, Heather. We can certainly fix the Biodiversity Conservation Act. Great. Uh, the next question from the crowd, Corinne. All right, this one's a little bit longer. The International Energy Agency stated that we must not have new fossil coal or gas extraction in developed countries if we want to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees. Would you support no new fossil fuel extraction, i.e. gas, coal and fracking? Thanks, Karen. And this time we'll go um, Victoria, then Heather, then Penny. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, yes, as I said in my previous um, answer, 100%, um, I will not support new coal, gas and fossil fuel projects. Um, we have enough resources to be a renewable power leader in, and there is no point investing in old technology. We need to be we need to be um, putting all resources into a green economy. It is absolutely fundamental that we make this an urgent priority. It is like rebuilding after a war. All available resources have to go towards um, rebuilding our renewable energy supply. Any diversion of it into old technology like fossil fuels um, is, is going to delay us. Thanks, Victoria. Um, Heather. Not only do we need to stop all new coal and gas extraction projects as soon as possible, if not immediately, we need to stop subsidising coal and gas development. There was $11.6 billion worth of coal and gas subsidies in 2021-22, according to the Australia Institute, which is a $1.3 billion increase. We also need to stop coal and gas companies from being able to make donations to political parties. Transparency would uncover a lot of what's going on here. We need to stop this kind of dependence on coal and gas for all kinds of 
uh, improper reasons and move on with getting an, into a renewable, sustainable green economy. That's absolutely fundamental. So getting rid of coal and gas and stop ex extraction and uh, mining is absolutely fundamental greens policy, urgently. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. Um, and Penny. Well, there's obviously a reason that when I did um, vote Compass, I fell oh. into the Greens area. Um, I know, look, I agree with everything that's been said, but I have, to I have to take it on notice in terms of Labor policy. And I'd love to give you a very nice fleshed out answer to that. And I would like to send that to you. Um, um, but you, I've explained very, in a, I guess, quite a bit about myself and about um, my activism within the party. And um, I can tell you that I will take that with me if I'm elected uh, to parliament, as will my colleague out at Heathcote, who is also on the executive um, of Lean. We, that's, that's why I'm, I'm running. That's one of the reasons that I'm here. Um, and as, as I said to you earlier, I think there are different ways to fight this. There's a different place to fight it. And you can fight it within parties that are capable of actually making, of forming a majority government and making decisions. Uh, or you can fight it from the outside or on the crossbench. But the, I've chosen to fight it from within the party. And uh, I also hold many of the Labor values very close. So uh, that's one of the reasons. There you go. Lovely. Thanks, Penny. Uh, and just looking at the time, Corinne, I think we've probably got time for one more question. I can answer that question if you like, because I I didn't get to say it in the last, um, if you Yeah, like. go for it. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so the New South Wales um, Electricity Infrastructure Roadmap and Renewable Energy Zones, uh, the New South Wales government is taking decisive action to reduce emissions from the generation of electricity. Sorry, Ben, just to clarify, the question was about ruling out coal and gas extraction, not renewable energy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was just talking about the coal um, five power plants. Okay, yep. yeah. Um, so four of the five, with four of the five coal-fired power stations coming to their scheduled end of life by 2035, we need to ensure we have the next generation of energy infrastructure in place to keep our grid affordable, reliable and clean. The New South Wales Energy Infrastructure Roadmap sets out the state's 20-year plan to develop, uh, to deliver the generation storage firming and transmission infrastructure we need to power New South Wales into the future. The implementation of the roadmap is well advanced. The first tender for long-term energy service agreements for generation and long duration storage commenced in October, 2022. From this tender, 16 projects of more than 4.3 gigawatts of generation and long duration storage have been shortlisted. A second, round, a second tender round is scheduled to commence in the second quarter of 2023, which will com uh, comprise generation, long duration storage and firming technologies. Great, thank you. Um, and one more question. Yep. Last, last question probably. Um, what are your thoughts on increasing the uptake of electric vehicles and installing community batteries to leverage solar panel adoption? Um, and this time, let's go, um, Heather, Penny. Did you want to respond to that question as well, um, Ben? You're on. Yeah. No, I, I'll, 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 I'll list. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. The I only can... reason I had that was because I couldn't um, finish that in the other You question. didn't get it all in time. Okay, no worries. Okay. That's the only um, reason. Then let's go Heather, Penny, Victoria. Sorry, I'm trying to keep a, a list of what order we're going in. Um, Heather, Penny, Victoria. Um, and the question was about um, increasing the uptake of electric vehicles and installing community batteries to leverage solar adoption. Community batteries are a very good idea, uh, particularly with um, regard to the affordability of batteries, which are not cheap at all. Um, you're looking at about eleven ten thousand dollars for a battery for a five five um, kilowatt system for a house. Most people can't afford that. Community batteries, which enable people to pool resources and then pull off that battery, um, a much better idea. Uh, it just requires some legislation to try to support that because there's going to be some infrastructural um, um, argy bargy going on there with regard to access and entitlement. So that needs some legislative support and work done on that. Electric vehicles, of course, are a good idea. Once again, cost is the major impediment. They're lovely, 
and they're quiet and they go very fast. Um, there's some people who are importing secondhand electric vehicles from, from Japan, Nissan's, and you can get those much cheaper. Um, they seem to be fine. I know people who've got them, but we need to subsidize them. You can't just expect electric vehicles to suddenly storm the market and take over without some subsidies. They need to be supported to change from the, the uh, other existing uh, problem vehicles. We also need to improve our fuel quality standards so as to reduce this garbage that's being sold in the Australian car market, which is uh, substandard even by European or American standards. We need to do a whole variety of things to move away from polluting transport vehicles. Of course, moving into public transport and bikes and walking is also very desirable. Thanks, Heather. Um, next, we'll go to Penny on electrification of um, cars. Thank you. I like walking. I like catching public transport when it turns up. Um, so that's something, I, and I meant to say that in my first uh, two years, there, there's three things that obviously have to get fixed quickly. It's our transport system, it's our education system, and it's our healthcare system, all with an eye uh, on emissions and sustainability. But in terms of electric vehicles, I drive the cheapest electric vehicle on the market, and I love it. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit angry about Teslas at the moment because when you go to get a charge um, at a normal charger, it's full of Teslas because they've finished their two years of free charging and they're in our spaces and leaving their own uh, empty. So there, there's that. I, I, want to I want, also want to give a shout out to Lane Council who've done wonderful things with electric charging uh, in the canopy um, and it's all solar. It's all, come, it's all uh, free. Uh, so fantastic stuff there. They've also done some good things with community batteries. But the big thing is for Labor is uh, the announcement of the New South Wales Energy Security Corporation, which is going to, uh, it is actually set up to try and establish more community batteries. It's important for Labor, it's core Labor business to make sure that we don't have energy poverty moving into the future. And um, obviously there are lots of, uh, with, with electric vehicles, uh, and electrification on homes. Uh, it ob obviously uh, represents new opportunities in manufacturing and in jobs, which is core labour business as well. Thanks, Penny. Um, and Victoria. Thanks. Um, yeah, community batteries play a huge role. And, um, you know, we're not going to replace um, major coal-fired power stations with something of equal size. What is fantastic about the renewable economic revolution is that there's going to be lots of different ways in which we replace that energy. And we need to look at lots of different options, community batteries being one of them, especially for renters and especially for the strata sector. So much of electrification um, support and subsidies are aimed at um, owner-occupier freestanding dwellings and that really um, um, leaves out a huge amount of our, of our other homes and residences. So community batteries are definitely something we need to um, look at as well as shared solar. Um, EV uptake, um, you know, one great thing about an EV that that car can be used as a battery for 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 a home or, or, or for for a dwelling, um, and yes, we need to fast track that as quickly as possible. And I understand the federal role in that. The state government and local governments, as Penny said, local all levels of government need to work to make sure that that's a priority instead of you know building more roads. Um, we need to electrify our public transport as quickly as possible because public transport is a huge part of our emissions and making really better available and electrified public transport will ease the need for people to have um, cars. We also need standardised charging as well, which is incredibly important. Great, thank you, Victoria, and thanks to all, to all the candidates for answering these questions. Um, that's all that we have time for, for, for questions from the audience. And thank you, Corinne, and to our um, wonderful volunteers behind the scenes collating all of those questions. And thanks to everyone for popping them in the chat and for engaging in the conversation this evening. So great to have such um, a, a good turnout of, um, of folks from the Lane Cove electorate. I think at, there at one point um, I saw we were up, up closer to 70 people that were in the Zoom room this evening. So well done and uh, really shows that this is such a critical issue for the local electorate. Um, 
And uh, if everyone wants to join me in giving a virtual round of applause for our candidates, I just want to thank you very much for um, giving up your Thursday evening for being here. I know you're all very busy on the campaign trail. And um, I think we've had a really good cross section of constituents from the Lane Cove electorate here, um, you know, really raising some very important issues for the local electorate and, and also across the state. So thank you very much. And I'll pass it back now to Shauna, um, who's going to wrap us up for the evening. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Jackie. So I'd like to thank Jackie on behalf of the, all of us um, from the Nature Conservation Council for her role in the forum tonight. And also thanks to all the candidates, of course, uh, in alphabetical order, Heather Armstrong, Victoria Davidson, Penny Peterson, and Anthony Roberts. And the team representing so many active groups in the area concerned with the environment and nature who are here tonight. Also, Corinne Fagare for reading the questions from the chat, Dr. Alison Blasey and Dr. Justin Bauer representing Doctors for the Environment, Lynn Nasir and Roz Noon from the Lane Cove Sustainability Action Group, Jade Pierce from the Total Environment Centre, and Christina Dodds from the Nature Conservation Council for organising us all. Thank you so much. A final word I've been asked to uh, speak about, which I think is so helpful, about preferential voting. I'd just like to say a few words about the operation of the New South Wales optional preferential system of voting. At federal elections, to seats in the House of Representatives, you need to number every box for your vote to be valid. However, for elections to seats in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, of which Lane Cove is one, you only need to mark the ballot paper so as to clearly identify your one single most preferred candidate for your vote to be valid. But although not being required, you can number candidates in any, any of the order you prefer, and we would encourage voters to do so to ensure the best result for nature. Numbering candidates enables the preferential system to achieve what it was um, designed to do, namely ensure that when no single candidate gets a majority of first preference votes, the candidate who is least disliked by voters gets elected. It operates as an automatic runoff system. For a valid preferential vote, you do not need to number all the candidates standing. You can number as many as you wish. But if there is a candidate you don't wish to see elected, you should number all the candidates you prefer other than that candidate. Um, so my last um, action to, set, to do is to ask people if you are happy um, to turn up your video, only if you're happy to do it. So Christina can take photographs of all the people on the screen. So thanks, Shauna. I think we can wrap it up there. Oh, Thank you. I, I did so I wish everybody the best and fantastic that you all came tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you thanks. very much. Great opportunity. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.